morning. Uh, I'm Michael Eason, Chair of the AATCC <coughs> Gulf Coast Section, and I'd like to welcome everyone to today's seminar presentation by Dr. Alfred French. Al French began his research career at the USDA after getting his BS degree in 1965, working on starch films. He left after one and a half years to obtain a PhD and learned to use X-ray diffraction to characterize the molecular and crystal structures in those starch films. He then rejoined the USDA in 1971 and continues working here despite having retired in January. Uh, Dr. French's PhD research required computer models to interpret the diffraction patterns and he became better known for his work in molecular modeling of cellulose and other carbohydrate structures. During the first 20 years or so, he existed based on software that he wrote and or developed. After a brief stint as manager of the SRRC computer group, during which personal computing replaced central systems for many uses, he began using commercially available software that greatly expanded his range of problems that could be studied. In the past five years or so, his interests have included the effects of solvent on molecular shape, the use of electron density analysis to understand weak interactions in carbohydrates, and a return to the calculation of X-ray diffraction patterns from models to better understand the experimental diffraction data. His professional service activities include a substantial journal referee load and service as research leader of the Cotton Fiber Quality Research Unit for nine years. He also served in the American Chemical Society's Louisiana section as chair and in various officer positions including chair in the ACS Division of Carbohydrate Chemistry in the 1990s. This is the final six, final year of a six-year journey as chair-elect, chair, and past chair of the ACS Division of Cellulose and Renewable Materials. His efforts were recognized by the Anselm Payen Award of the Cellulose Division in 2009, designation as a Fellow of the ACS in 2010, and as a fellow of the Cellulose Division in 2014. Uh, Dr. French was also honored twice as the Southern Regional Research Center's Outstanding Scientist in 1995 and 2012. He was drafted in 2012 to serve as Editor-in-Chief of the journal Cellulose, which published nearly 300 papers last year and is on track to exceed that number this year. Please join me in welcoming Dr. French. Thank you, Michael. Uh, welcome. Good morning, everybody. And uh, I'd like to start off here by making sure that everybody knows that uh, some of this work is uh, uh, written up in a presentation and, and a paper uh, that uh, Michael Santiago is a co-author of. And, and uh, uh, we've also got some other publications in this <coughs> particular area. So, this is kind of a picture of what we think cotton cellulose fiber is uh, like. Uh, it's uh, composed of a cuticle, a primary wall, a winding layer, and secondary wall, which is the bulk of the cellulose material in a mature fiber. And you see microfibrils running at different angles to the lumen here, or the length of the fiber. Uh, this is a complete plant cell attached to a seed when it's growing in the cotton plant. And in this uh, microfibril, there are several crystallites of, of cellulose. Uh, here, here's a, a model of a crystal. This one happens to have 49 molecules that look like this, uh, just polymers of glucose here. So uh, mostly what you see, if you make an X-ray diffraction study of, of, the, of a bundle of fibers or of a single fiber, uh, is this secondary wall uh, giving a, a response to these crystals. And here are some pictures of, uh, of transmission electron micro micrographs of cellulose particles that were isolated by acid treatments of uh, tunicate in the upper picture, or in the lower picture, and cotton in the upper picture. You see these long fragments here. Uh, this is some work uh, from uh, the CERMOB in Grenoble, France, uh, my good colleagues there. 
uh, published in Biomacromolecules back in 2008. But the, these are uh, quite crystalline particles. And uh, these are some ideas of the different sizes for the different kinds of cellulosic materials. So here's a cotton crystal here. Uh, in this drawing here, the, uh, these are projections down that long cellulose molecule. So the, the cellulose molecules coming out of the screen at you. Uh, Abacel, which is made from wood cellulose, comes in smaller crystallites. And the tunicate uh, cellulose, which is uh, the tunic of a marine animal, a very primitive marine, marine animal, uh, has the largest and most crystalline uh, cellulose uh, that has been found so far. Nice large crystals. And those are used if you want to study, uh, do a diffraction study to find out what the structure is. You want to have the, the largest and most uh, well-ordered crystals that you can come up with. So here's an idea of the diffraction experiment. Uh, this is one of these model crystals here that I've shown, but it could be a real one. And the main x-ray beam passes through the uh, model crystal or the real crystal and hits, in, in the case of the experiment, a piece of lead that's here to keep it from ruining a piece of photographic film or a, a CCD detector like's in a modern digital camera, which is what most people use. Uh, but some of the intensity is goes off as a diffracted beam and makes these individual spots here. The basic idea of this phenomenon is that each of the atoms is excited in the, uh, in the crystal, and when they are excited, then they fall back to a lower energy level and each give off their own X radiation at the same wavelength. And this radiation is broadcast spherically from each of the atoms, but these spherical waves going out create interference, both positive and destructive interference, and so you end up with spots. And the more uh, atoms that you have in a nice regular array, the better the contrast is between the radiation that's uh, being scattered and, and interacting positively or negatively, destructively, and so you get a sharper and sharper pattern with a bigger and bigger crystal. So here's some pictures of, of cotton uh, that were taken. This is a, a, a fiber bundle. It was, uh, the diffraction pattern was taken at uh, LSU. They have a synchrotron up there, which is a very powerful source of x-rays. And it's a, a very nice pattern of cotton. This uh, shadow going across here is uh, the, sh it's a beam, the beam catch holder. So this is that little piece of lead that keeps, that protects the, uh, image recording device from getting a huge dose of X radiation that would ruin it right away. Uh, this is a piece of secondary wall in an electron microscope and uh, you see here that the long arcs that corresponded to those spots a few slides ago uh, are now back to short arcs here because this is just a fragment of the cellulose with a bunch of the microfibril bundles next to each other. But uh, in either case you see you have uh, as go, you go from the center along this, imagine that this is a photometer of some sort. So as you're going out here uh, along this path, you pass over these two bumps here and then a great big bump here. The same is true over here. You have the center of the pattern and two smaller bumps and then a great big huge bump, as well as some other spots here that uh, are more or less analogous. And the reason here is this uh, distribution of the microfibrils to the lumen. There are a bunch of uh, different angles of those microfibrils, and so the diffraction patterns have been slightly rotated for each one of the layers of the secondary wall, and it produces these arcs, where here we're just looking at one, and we have a much tighter distribution of the crystallite orientations. So <clears throat> cellulose crystallinity can be divided up into two major, major ideas. One is, one is the idea that we want to find out what crystal form you're dealing with. And there are a bunch of different crystal forms. You'd think that cellulose would always crystallize in the same way, but it, it's not so at all. Uh, the native celluloses can be either identified as one alpha or one beta, and that, or a mixture of the two. If you give the uh, cellulose a sodium hydroxide treatment, it converts it to cellulose too. Also, if you dissolve it and reprecipitate the cellulose from solution, you'll get a cellulose 2 diffraction pattern. If you give either of these uh, forms, any of these forms, an, an ammonia treatment or a, an amine treatment, uh, and, and 
evaporate the ammonia or amine, uh, you'll get cellulose 3, and it depends on, their, the patterns are actually for different structures, they look very similar patterns, but uh, depends on whether you made it from 1 or from, from 2, uh, you get 3 sub 1 or 3 sub 2. Cellulose 4 results from high temperature treatments, and there's quite a bit of controversy regarding uh, cellulose 4, especially when it's made from 1. People say, well, maybe you've just decrystallized the 1. The cellulose 2 uh, converted into 4 is very distinctly different. Uh, so anyway, one of the ideas is to determine which of the crystal forms that you have. So for instance, if you gave it a sodium hydroxide treatment, did I really convert it to cellulose 2 or not? That's a, an important piece of information in your, in your work because uh, cellulose 2 has different physical properties than cellulose 1 does. But another idea of crystallinity is to see how perfect these crystals are or how wide-ranging they are. Uh, so uh, another way to look at this is uh, you can say, well, the, uh, in, in Leon Siegel's, I should mention Leon Siegel uh, a little bit. Leon Siegel was one of SRRC's uh, stellar employees uh, from uh, the 50s through the 80s. Uh, and uh, so he was here when I got here. and. and uh, he applied the general concepts of polymer theory to cellulose and, and x-ray diffraction. And so uh, he started off by dividing the cellulose into crystalline and non-crystalline material, or if you say non-crystalline and amorphous, some people mean that means the same thing to other people think amorphous is more non-crystalline than non-crystalline. So that's a little bit uh, of confusion there. But, uh, and we... We don't think that that's necessarily correct now. And maybe there's a gradient of properties. So you start off with something really crystalline in the center of a crystal, and then as you go out toward the edges, it's not quite so crystalline anymore, but it's still fairly well ordered. But uh, there are three different factors for sure that would be factored into most people's measurements of crystallinity. One is the size of the crystals, and the smaller the crystals are, the less crystalline the material is, even though each of the crystals might be perfect it will give a smaller value in most crystallinity measurements. And then if you have uh, uh, imperfect imperfections in the crystals, uh, so suppose you have a chain end and another chain begin, well that would disrupt the, the crystal. Or maybe on the surfaces you have the hydroxyl groups oriented in different ways or the primary hydroxyl groups oriented in different ways. And then some, some of the molecules just may not be in, in crystals at all. And one of the thoughts that we have, and, and we, I don't have any proof, and it's probably not true, but one of the hypotheses that I think we need to keep checking is to see if the primary wall crystals are different sizes than the secondary wall crystals. And then you could have different crystallinities in your practical samples by having different ratios of primary and secondary wall depending on the maturity. So the crystallinity is associated with accessibility or reactivity to moisture, enzymes, reagents. The less crystalline, the more accessible and more reactive things are thought to be. If you, one of the things that uh, uh, Mike Reynolds was concerned about uh, early on was whether the hydro entanglement line, jets of water under thousands of psi of pressure was decrystallizing the sample. So we looked at, to see if there was any damage to the crystallinity of the samples by running it through hydroentanglement. We found that it wasn't. But uh, there are other kinds of processing that definitely will decrystallize the cellulose. And then uh, the strength and the elongation of uh, properties depend on the crystallinity. And the maturity uh, seems to depend to a certain extent on uh, the more crystalline a, a molecule is, probably the more mature it is, too. There's a correlation there. So there are lots of reasons. I, w I wanted to do a literature search of the SRRC reprint database to find out how many times x-rays were mentioned. X-ray diffraction was mentioned, but our database just got transferred with the expiration of XP to a Windows 7 computer, and, and nobody knows how to make it work anymore. So uh, couldn't do that. <coughs> So I'm going to review the diffraction phenomena, what is a cellulose crystal like, what is amorphous cellulose like, and I'll start off by saying it's not a, place of a plate of spaghetti, and how do we calculate diffraction patterns, at least one of the ways today, and what is the effect of crystallite size on the cellulose diffraction. 
So here's, here's a, a perfect fiber with a bunch of crystals in it. They're oriented uh, differently towards each other, but they all are parallel along the same axis. And that uh, random array for millions and millions of crystallites is this equivalent to having one crystal rotated uh, through 360 degrees and you get a pattern of diffraction spots. If the crystallites aren't aligned perfectly, uh, but are tilted relative to each other, then you see uh, the spots turn into little bitty arcs here, and the more misalignment you have, the longer the arcs are. And then if you have a powder where all the crystallites are completely randomly oriented, then you get rings in the diffraction pattern. So our cotton pattern that I showed you a while back was nearly in the ring, uh, composed of rings, but the arcs weren't quite that long. So if you uh, if, remember when we had that cotton pattern and we scanned along that shadow with the two bumps and then the big bump, uh, this is a, a typical powder diffraction pattern that we can get from either uh, Pierre Burnside down at Tulane's uh, instrumentation group over, uh, or over at UNO and John Wiley's uh, group. Uh, either, either one of them will do diffraction for us. We used to have We've had at least three diffractometers over the years at SRRC, but uh, we got rid of them all for various reasons. Uh, if we have one of these really good patterns like this uh, with hundreds of diffraction spots, then we can go ahead and work out the X, Y, and Z coordinates of the atom positions in the unit cell. And uh, that's very valuable information because once we have that, then we can apply that information for looking at the practical samples that you might encounter. So uh, one of the things that you get when you do a, a crystallographic study of the atom positions is a list of the X, Y, and Z coordinates for the different atoms in the unit cell, along with the unit cell dimensions here. Uh, this is for cellulose 3 sub 1, which is uh, a very simple unit cell. And this is the entire information from a crystal information file uh, that I created from typing it up from the published coordinates of, of the paper. And what I'm going to show you is, um, well, first, you can, here's, here's that uh, cellulose three unit cell as depicted in the computer program Mercury that's a free download. Uh, here's here's uh, one uh, cellulose BIOS unit in the unit cell. And uh, we can extend that chain to make the chain longer. So this is more or less coming out of the screen at you here. And then by just moving along the A axis and units of the unit cell length, you can generate uh, more of, the, of a model crystal here. And then uh, moving along that along the B-axis in different directions, you see now we have a 16 molecule crystal here to, uh, to look at. And we can, if, we, if we got uh, information from the uh, Scherer formula that this is what size the crystal was, then we'd have a model of what to look at and expect this is something that we could uh, understand better uh, what we're doing. So uh, the, the two simple ways, the Siegel crystallinity index and the Scherer formula, are two simple ways to modify or to analyze the diffraction pattern. Siegel's method was uh, to take the height of the, the biggest peak and subtract the in intensity between the peaks where there wasn't any intensity and then divide it by this uh, maximum in intensity. So it was a very simple ratio and that was supposed to give the percentage of a crystalline and amorphous material by calculating the crystalline, crystallinity index, which was the percentage of crystalline material. The Scherer formula has been around even longer since 1918. This is the year after, this is the 101st anniversary of the first X-ray experiments on cellulose, by the way. Um, and this, this formula here, the Scherer formula, just takes the, the uh, wavelength of the radiation and the uh, width of the peak at half height and uh, the cosine of the position of the peak uh, in degrees theta, uh, which is the y axis or the x axis of the diffraction pattern, and gives you the, the crystallite size. So it's a very simple analysis. And here's, here's uh, exam exemplified. So to do the Siegel method, the Siegel crystallinity me method, Here's the intensity at about 18 degrees 2 theta on this uh, x-axis here. And here's the maximum intensity. So this value is 10,000 on this scale. It's a calculated diffraction pattern. This value is about 1,000 on this scale. So 
10,000 minus 1,000 is 9,000 divided by 10,000 is 90 percent crystallinity. So that's that's uh, pretty easy here uh, to to get that value. It's, it's that quick and that fast. If you want to get the peak width at half height, then uh, since this is a 10,000 at 5,000, you go over here and measure the distance from here to here in degrees two theta, and that gives you the, the peak width at half height for putting into the Scherer formula to get the crystallite size. So that's, that's uh, pretty simple stuff. And uh, here are some different calculated diffraction patterns. So if you have a peak width at half height of a tenth of a degree, here you get very nice sharp peaks, and that corresponds to a crystal si crystallite size of about 900 angstroms. And uh, this one is uh, 0.4 uh, degrees here already, and uh, this is 0.8 degrees, and that's 112 uh, angstroms. So that's about the size of a tunicate uh, crystal, and that's a pretty similar to a tunicate crystal's diffraction pattern. And now we're down into the range where cotton uh, might be found here with a 56 angstrom crystal at 1.6 uh, degrees of peak width at half height. So uh, this gives you a, a feel for what, what we can do with, with this method already to understand the relationship between uh, the diffraction pattern and the crystallite size. So these are just some pictures of, of different kinds of model crystals, uh, relatively big one, relatively small one, just like we saw from Nishiyama's work in biomacromolecules, but we've added molecular dynamics to this so that the atoms are vibrating with the thermal energy and if we just freeze it we'll get a, a model crystal that looks like this. We have other software that can, can deal with those models as well. I'm not going to talk about that today, but I wanted you to be aware of it. So going to this idea that, uh, that Polymers have a crystalline phase and an amorphous phase, and the amorphous phase looks like spaghetti. Uh, cellulose is a flat ribbon, and so it looks like fettuccine instead of, uh, of spaghetti. And uh, I've said, no, that isn't what uh, amorphous cellulose looks like. And uh, if you download this Mercury program, which we've got the link here for, uh, it takes in the crystal information files you can either get from the, the published literature or create yourself easily enough with a text editor. And uh, so here's the Mercury program running, and I've loaded in the unit cell of, of cellulose 1 here. So these, these lines here show the different dimensions of the unit cell. These are the two independent glucose units that are repeated to form the crystal uh, through symmetry operators. And down here at the bottom, there's a button called powder. And if you just push this uh, powder button here, you'll get a powder pattern showing up on the screen just like that with the very sharp peaks here. So we can see what all different spots are contributing to the diffraction pattern. And if we customize this pattern here uh, by changing the wavelength to what is a more practical value than the default for some reason, and we can change the range that you calculate the pattern over to shorten it up because you usually don't go out uh, to such high two theta values as the default. And you put in a peak width of one and a half degrees here at half height. Uh, and, and you press the OK button here, you get a pattern that looks pretty much like our cotton diffraction pattern. So uh, that shows how simple it is to model a pattern and you can save this uh, uh, the values of the intensity versus the two theta axis to a file and put it into Excel and compare it with the experimental patterns that you have until you can see that they fit each other nicely and then you can take advantage of that peak width and half height that you put in and say well that's what size crystal we have and uh, so we can understand what we're, we're looking at better. Notice that uh, Siegel's value for the amorphous showed up here uh, in this calculated pattern, this, this material here, which he considered to be amorphous, and that crystal information file that we read in to calculate the diffraction pattern had no information at all about amorphous material in that crystal information file, but yet Siegel would have considered this to only be 90% crystalline. So what, what the flaw in his thinking was is that uh, these peaks would come down and not uh, overlap enough to create this uh, intensity here in between the, the, the larger peaks. But uh, 
uh, it turns out that people now realize that the shape of the peaks is not a Gaussian distribution, but somewhere between a Gaussian and a Lorentzian uh, curve shape, and that that uh, curve shape uh, causes a considerable amount of overlap down here at the bottom. bottom. It's called a pseudo void uh, curve shape. And so if you want to resolve these peaks, you need to use a, a pseudo void uh, type of curve. But you see there are many other peaks. People usually try to resolve this with just two curves or three curves at most. And there are many more peaks here along this line. So I think it's better to work from a calculated pattern to make it look like, see what you have to do to make it look like your observed pattern, rather than to try to deconvolute that pattern. But we don't have uh, uh, anything for any amorphous material in this pattern, and there's going to be some amorphous material show up. So people are going to want to do that. If you uh, make these calculated curves, uh, again, for many different peak widths at half heights, you see how this uh, uh, intensity at 18 degrees, which is thought to be, uh, in Siegel's uh, thinking, the amorphous contribution to the diffraction pattern, see how that just goes up and up and up to where this uh, uh, five degree peak width at half height pattern uh, is only about 47% crystalline on the Siegel crystallinity index. And notice how high this is here. Now, on the cellulose 2 calculated pattern, uh, they, they comparable value to the 18 degrees in the cellulose 1 uh, uh, determination of the amorphous materials. It's supposed to be at about 16 degrees here. And you see how here, even though the, the peak widths at half heights were input at the same values, this value is much, much uh, lower here the other one, the cellulose one, was at about this point here. So uh, just because of the, the way the peaks are, how close they are to their, the minimum in between them, uh, in cellulose one and cellulose two causes a vastly different value of the crystallinity to show up. So you can't use a Siegel crystallinity type of method to compare the crystallinity of a cellulose one and a cellulose two. So this, this just shows how the, the two different uh, uh, cellulose 1 and cellulose 2 calculated crystallinity indices vary with crystallite size. And uh, here's the cellulose 1 curve. You see, at a given crystallite size, it's much less crystalline, according to the Siegel crystallinity index, than the cellulose 2 pattern is. Usually, you get lower crystallinity index values from cellulose 2 anyway. So it's typically smaller crystals than cellulose 1. Crystals. Oh, I hit back button. Sorry. So this is a this is a, a, a comparison of a calculated pattern with some gin motes that uh, Vince uh, uh, had uh, had furnished as, as part of a project he was working on. And this shows how well you can get with uh, how well you can fit the two patterns with uh, just uh, a very uh, simple. Uh, fitting of the, of the two with just a few variables. And so we think you can safely conclude things about the crystallite size. It, it's actually very difficult to get an, uh, a calculated and experimental pattern to fit if you don't have more variables here. But the experimental patterns have a, a fair standard deviation in, in these positions, it turns out. Uh, so uh, it's, it's not clear that we're, we're doing at all poorly in uh, being able to fit this. Get, get, uh, then we know what information uh, to use to calculate the size of a crystal that we might be looking at. So in conclusion, uh, the Siegel crystallinity index correlates with variations in crystallite size, even though all crystals were 100% perfect crystals, uh, except for these, this size factor. And the experimental and calculating, calculated patterns agree fairly well, not perfectly. The experiments are fairly difficult to achieve random orientation of the powder particles is the main problem. And purity of the sample is essential if you're going to attribute all of the diffraction pattern to cellulose. And you cannot use uh, the crystallinity index to compare mercerized and, and native cotton cellulose. The peak broadening 
due to disorder is similar to crystallite size. Uh, so you can lump the disorder in with the crystallite size if you like, uh, more conveniently than you can lump crystallite size into the disorder. I think it's, it's a better approximation. And if you're going to publish your paper in silos, uh, I expect people to use the modern indexing uh, with C as the fiber axes and Miller indices as uh, we showed in, in the slides and the unit cells with obtuse monoclinic angles. There many conventions have been used over the years, but in order to establish the relationship between your patterns that you're analyzing and the modern crystal structures, I want everybody to use the same uh, conventions. And uh, we've, we've done the calculated plots for uh, all the other polymorphs uh, that are known, uh, crystal structures are known for, and they've been published uh, in a, another issue of Silos that just came out. That's the end. Thank you.